Good morning, Interweb. Let's create some rivers, shall we? To create viable river systems, you'll need to figure out how water will flow over the topography of your fantasy maps. To do this, mark out the ridges of your major mountain ranges and highland regions. These lines are your drainage divides, and the areas they create are your drainage basins. Next, roughly mark in your minor ridges. Using these lines, carve up your drainage basins into several smaller river basins of varying size. For comparison, here's a map of the drainage divides of North America, and here's a map of the river basins of the contiguous US. Next step is to place a primary river in each of your river basins. For the sake of time, I'll only work on this basin. You should complete all of yours. Couple of tips here. Pay attention to your topography. Run your rivers from areas of high elevation to areas of low elevation. Run them in between your ridges and through your valleys. And make sure they take a fairly direct path. No overly complicated courses, no broad sweeping curves, and no splitting. Now mark in some tributaries, following the same rules as before. Then some tributaries of your tributaries, so on and so forth, and boom, river map done. Note that in temperate and tropical regions, you'll find a lot of rivers, and they'll be permanent gaining rivers. That is, they'll flow all year round, and the volume of water they carry increases in the downstream direction. Dry, arid zones will tend to have fewer rivers, and they'll be ephemeral, losing rivers. They only flow for part of the year, and the volume of water they carry decreases in the downstream direction. A dried up river is known as a dry wash, wadi, or arroyo. With your rivers in, let's figure out the sort of features we'd expect to see along their courses. To do this, we can divide a river into three stages, youthful, mature, and old age. The youthful stage of river is its mountain stage. This is where the river starts its journey, the gradient of the land is steep, and the flow of the river is fast. And the river channel is deep, narrow, and V-shaped. Expect valleys, canyons, rapids, and waterfalls. The mature stage is an in-between hilly stage. The gradient of the land is moderate, the flow of the river is also moderate, and the river channel is a bit shallower, wider, and U-shaped. Expect braided streams, mild meanders, narrow floodplains, and terrace floodplains. Finally, the old stage is the final lowland stage of your river. The gradient of the land is shallow, the river's flow is slow, and the river channel is shallower and wider again. Expect broad floodplains, extreme meanders, oxbow lakes, yazoo streams, and deltas. So a river will begin at a source, usually a mountain spring or meltwater from a snowfield or glacier. If the water passes over relatively soft underlying rock, the fast flowing river will carve out a V-shaped valley with interlocking spurs. If the rock is relatively hard, slot canyons will form. And if the rock alternates between hard and soft rock, expect stair-step canyons, like the Grand Canyon. If glaciation occurs, a glacier can erode a V-shaped valley into a U-shaped valley, where the interlocking spurs get truncated and hanging valleys form. Rapids will form anytime a river passes over large rocky debris, abruptly narrows, or passes over a sufficiently steep gradient. And waterfalls will form anytime an escarpment of hard rock is met. As the river leaves the mountains and enters its mature stage, its channel may become choked with loose gravelly sediment. If this occurs, the river will split into numerous interweaving channels. This is known as a braided stream, and these deposits are called braid bars. The river will also begin to meander slightly, though it won't be as curvy as it will be in its old stage. On the outer curve of a meander, there will be a steep cut bank, and on the inner curve, the river will deposit gravelly sediment in wedge-shaped point bars. Flooding in mature stage river valleys can fill the valley with alluvium, deposits of clay, silt and sand, forming fertile floodplains. These will be fairly narrow in the mature stage. If the river cuts down into the floodplain after its formation, a structure known as a terraced floodplain will be created. As the river exits the hills, it enters its old age stage, crossing over the fall line. The fall line is the imaginary line delineating the upland and coastal regions where rivers plunge or fall at roughly the same elevation. Important settlements can often be found along the fall line, because the line represents the point at which boats can no longer travel upstream, and the energy released by the waterfalls and rapids can be used to power water and sawmills. Beyond the fall line, the river's floodplains will widen, and its meanders will become increasingly more pronounced. Like before, we'll find cup banks and point bars, only now the point bars will be soft and sandy. Also, meanders get curvier over time, 
when a curve gets too extreme, a meander neck is formed. Eventually, the river will cut through the weak meander neck, rerouting the river. The cutoff portion of the river is called an oxbow lake if it remains filled with water, or an abandoned meander if it dries up. The river may also briefly split to form small, emphasis on small, river islands. Oh, and the ever-evolving paths of river can lead to interesting territory disputes given that rivers are frequently used to mark political boundaries. Deposition during flooding can create low ridges known as natural levees. In regions where large natural levees form, low marshy swampland may form on the other side of the levees. The levees may also block small tributaries from entering the main river. These adorably named Yazoo streams flow instead in the floodplain and trend parallel to the main river. Where the river enters the sea, a delta may form. Sediment from the slow moving river deposits at the river mouth to form a midstream bar. This causes the river to split. Each new distributary then deposits its own midstream bar and they split. Rinse, repeat and boom, you got a delta. If the ocean currents at the mouth of the river are a great deal stronger than the river currents, they'll prevent deposition by sweeping away material so no delta will form. If the ocean currents are only slightly stronger than the river currents, deposition will occur and a classic triangular delta or fan-shaped delta will form. If the ocean currents happen to hit the river mouth head on, the delta will form a curvy sided, V-shaped cuspate delta. These scenarios are the most common. In rare instances where the ocean currents are much weaker than the river currents, a bird's foot delta will form. Lakes can basically go anywhere along a river's course, though they are generally more common in highland regions. Mountain lakes may be located in depressions caused by tectonic activity and or glaciation and in volcano craters. Plunge pools from waterfalls are also classified as small lakes. In the lowland regions, they can occur where a river channel widens into a basin or in floodplain depressions. The important thing to note about lakes is that several rivers may flow into them, but only one may flow out. Also, little mini deltas may be present where a river enters a lake. You can roughly, very roughly, emphasis on roughly, ballpark how wide a river should be using these two formulas where OR is the rainfall in the area drained by a river in terms of millions of cubic meters per year. For context, very wet climates might have a value of 1,200, dry climates might be around 300. A is the area drained by a river in thousands of square kilometers, B is the provisional width of the river, and F is the so-called depth factor. So for argument's sake, let's say one of our rivers drains an area of 2,000 square kilometers, and that area receives 500 million cubic meters of rainfall per year then the provisional width of the river draining the area will be about 25 meters. Although you can vary this by about 30% either way if you wish. Now plug B into the second formula. If B is between 20 and 100, then F, the depth factor, is 2. If B is between 100 and 200, then F is 3. Between 200 and 500, F is 4. And above 500, F is 5. In our case, F is 2, so the width of the river proper is about 12.5 meters. Also, rivers don't meander randomly. It turns out, they tend to follow this ratio. That is, if the river is 1 meter wide, the radius of its meander curves will be about 2.3 meters, and the length of its meanders, one S-shaped section of the course, will be about 11 meters. This ratio holds regardless of river width. So let's finish up by covering some of the crazy things rivers can do. Question: Do rivers always flow down mountains? Answer, no, a minority of rivers cut through mountains. So imagine we have a river flowing out to the sea. Now imagine tectonic activity lifted up a mountain range. If the uplift was relatively fast, the river would be diverted, like we'd expect. If, however, the river eroded downwards at the same rate of uplift, the river will not be diverted and instead cut straight through the mountain chain, forming a water gap. Question, do all rivers empty into the sea? Answer, no. Endoreic basins are depressions in the land where water is allowed to flow in, but cannot flow out. Instead, evaporation is the only mechanism by which the water re-enters the hydrological cycle. In wetter regions, you can place salt lakes in these endoreic basins. In drier regions, you can place inland delta swamps. Think the Okavango River Delta. The Okavango River does not flow into the sea. Instead, it flows into an endoreic basin in Botswana, where it discharges into a swamp in the Kalahari Desert, known as the Okavango River Delta. Look at it, it's like the Nile, only inland. So cool. 
Question, do all rivers need to be contiguous? Answer, no, rivers can disappear and reappear. In karst regions, that is in regions where there's a lot of limestone, dolomite and gypsum knocking about, rivers may disappear down sinkholes and caves, flow for time as subterranean rivers, and then reappear on the surface downstream. The Santa Fe River in Florida does just this. It disappears down a sinkhole in Oleno State Park and reappears five kilometers downstream. So anyways, that is that. Rivers, how to plot them, their features and oddities, done. Good morning Interweb, this video is brought to you by Campfire Blaze. Campfire Blaze is a browser-based suite of tools to help you keep your writing organized. Collaborate with friends in real time or by yourself to flesh out every aspect of your story. Develop your manuscript in Blaze's word processor, create characters, design your plot and world build without restrictions. When you're done, you can easily share your story with friends and fans. Campfire Blaze is free, but you can expand upon the free version by purchasing tools for a one-time fee and own them forever. Alternatively, you can build your own subscription so you're only paying for the features you need. You can add modules for as little as 50 cents or unlock everything for a few dollars per month with a 30 day return policy. Campfire Blaze is a writing software that can visually organize the most complex stories you can dream up. Speaking of dreaming up stories, it's November, so NaNoWriMo is upon us. If you use Campfire Blaze to write 50,000 words during NaNoWriMo, you can be in with a chance to win $3,000 in self-publishing aid. Check out all the details at campfiretechnology.com forward slash contest. Links will also be in the description. So a massive thanks to Campfire for sponsoring the show. Campfire Blaze, write better stories faster. This video is also brought to you by you, the patrons. Special shout out goes out to Alexander Roper, Andrew P. Shahail, Johan Spadka, John Huyer, Ripta Passe, Spencer Brownlee, Terra Abla, and World Anvil. So thank you patrons, thank you Campfire, I will see you all in the next video. Until next time, Edgar out.